We're recording. Welcome, everybody. It's nice to see. Actually, only one person that I see. Everybody else has their cameras turned off, but it's nice to see at least one person and see that there are other people with their cameras turned off. Thank you for being here. And uh, just as a reminder, please, um, for those of you who are here live, this will, of course, be later on YouTube. But uh, if you're here live, please do mute yourself uh, other than when uh, the floor is open for for others to speak, just so that we're not hearing everybody else's sounds all at the same time. So today, <clears throat> I uh, have a, a little bit of a sore throat. I'm a little bit under the weather. And I thought it would be appropriate to then uh, explore how it is that everything is healing. And if this is the first time you've attended one of these or first time you've heard me talk about healing, then when I'm talking about healing, I'm talking about a recognition of wholeness and how this recognition of wholeness and when we choose to allow for this wholeness to spill over into our manifest lives, that this expresses as, or we experience this as uh, good. So we, we subjectively experience it as good. Now, if this is so, and if I'm proposing to you that this is available to us all, all the time, and if I'm proposing to you that I am living this and that I'm sharing this with you from my own experience, then how is it that a sore throat feeling under the weather could be healing? How is that possible? How is it possible that conflicts in relationships, apparent lack of money, all of the sorts of things that we can struggle with, how could that possibly be healing? Because the Conditioned mind says that's the opposite of healing. The conditioned mind says that's what we need to heal from. It says that that's the problem. Healing will be the solution. And that's tempting. But then we can just tell the truth and, and see what does that lead to. So if I, if I believe that what's presently happening is a problem, that this is not wholeness, that this is not the manifestation of wholeness, that wholeness is somewhere else, or that there is no wholeness, then what is the result of that? And Presumably, we all have experience of that in our lives. We all have abundant evidence to demonstrate what the outcome of that is, which is suffering. Because then all that I'm doing in that case is I'm just practicing what I don't want. So I don't mm -hmm. want to suffer, but I'm practicing suffering if I'm insisting that this is a problem, that this should not be, that this is not wholeness, that this is not healing. And then I have plenty of evidence to support that because then my I can look back and my whole life has been problem after problem after problem after problem after problem possibly with little intermissions in between in which 
there seem to not be a problem. But depending on depending on the person, those intermissions are long or short or non-existent. But we can just see that for most of us, I mean, maybe maybe not you. I don't know. I don't know you. Maybe not you. But it's been my observation that this is pretty common. That we're in the habit of rehearsing problems. So having a problem now, had a problem yesterday, day before that, probably have a problem tomorrow. And then I'm looking for a solution to the problem that will happen in the future. That's what I'm calling in this problem solution paradigm. That, that's what I call healing is this thing that's going to happen in the future in which there's the absence of what I'm thinking is the problem. But if we're just rehearsing that over and over and over and over, then should it surprise us that we get more of the same? And what I'm proposing is it shouldn't surprise us because we're, we're, we've all become very skilled at that. And we, we naturally do what we're skilled at. We do what we're in the habit of doing. So you, there, there. I, I don't know how many languages uh, presently spoken on the planet. Many languages, thousands of languages. I only speak one of those languages fluently. So naturally then because i'm rehearsed at that that's what i do i speak that language i don't speak the other languages because i don't know them i'm not practiced at them and i'm saying the same thing we can start to recognize that that's true of everything else that is happening in our lives that we do what we're in the habit of doing what we're practiced at what is familiar, what we have skill at. And we tend to shy away from what we don't have skill with or familiarity with. And we can, it, it, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, you know, in, in any, I don't remember the name of it, but in any psycho psychology 101 course, they'll tell you about this phenomenon that has a name, which is uh, if you give somebody a choice to say, you know, hey, do you want, uh, do you want, uh, you know, I think, I think the classic example is that there was a study and they said, okay, have this photo, you could have this photo or this photo. Which one do you want? And the person selects one of the photos. And afterward, suddenly, that's, for them, that's the better photo. The other one's not as good as the one that they got. So we also have this bias where we think that what we know is better. There's the other way around, which is the grass is greener. But either way, what we're overlooking is the, the, this vast, I would say, infinite field of potentiality that's here. And we're doing that by our habit of giving preference and saying that I know what this is and this is good or this is bad. And we reinforce that over and over and over and that gets reinforced. We could say it gets reinforced in consciousness. I don't know about that, but it definitely gets reinforced in the nervous system. We have pretty good evidence of that. So then that just continues to be the go-to for us because that's what we have facility with is that particular choice, that particular habit, that particular way, that particular preference. And then we start to feel like we're victims, victims of that. And what I'm proposing is something fairly radically different than that, 
which is that this right now is already wholeness. This right now is already healing, whatever is happening. And that when we choose that, that we get to experience it as, as it is, rather than how we think it is. So I certainly have a habit of a, a preference not to feel under the weather. So when that happens, then the habit is, oh no, this is a problem. But just because that's the habit doesn't mean that I have to actually believe that that's true. So when I choose to indulge that and believe that it is true, actually believing that it is true, then I'm reinforcing that. And then whatever happens next, I'm that much more likely to do the same. So we can see how this is, for example, uh, and we feel lonely, so we want companionship. We think loneliness is a problem, I need companionship. Companionship will be the solution to the problem of loneliness. Then because we're rehearsed at problems, then we get companionship, and then companionship is a problem. Just want some quiet. I wish this person would leave me alone. They're so obnoxious. They don't appreciate me. They don't understand me. They don't respect me. Or I don't deserve this. This isn't, I'm not good enough for this. I can't handle it. I can't stand it. But we're just rehearsing more of the same over and over and over. So then we push the person away and then we say, oh, see, there we go. Did it again. I'm a failure. I'm a loser. Oh, but now I'm lonely. I need companionship. And we just go cycle round and round and round. The only alternative that I've found is to Fundamentally, it's just to stop. But then what I, what I think that I'm, so, so we could say, you know, that, that message of stopping, that's not a particularly novel message. We've probably heard that before. Be here now. Stop seeking all these sorts of ways of saying it. So that's not in and of itself all that new, although still useful. So I, I'm not going to suggest otherwise. It's very useful. But then one of the um, pitfalls that I've experienced and that I've seen many other people apparently experiencing is that then we want to come back to this kind of uh, control of, okay, now I know and I have the solution and I know exactly what to do and I get to create this artificial safety by kind of hiding out in stopping. So stopping is, in my view, the essence of healing, to stop insisting that I know what this is, that I know that this is a problem, that I know that there needs to be a solution, that this is not wholeness, this is not healing, this is not enough, there's something wrong. So to stop, and not just to stop the thoughts, because the thoughts are just thoughts, but to stop the 
kind of at all levels. There's the, you can we can notice. I mean, I'd actually just invite you for a moment right now, just to notice in your actual experience right now, the amount of effort that you're making. any any amount of effort at all any kind of effort in you know at the at the mental level trying to figure it out do i agree with this guy do i disagree with this guy am i in the right place am i in the wrong place am i getting it am i not getting it so there's all that mental activity that you could just stop and not not through restraint, but just to stop, stop investing in it for a moment. And then also there's the somatic level. So the felt experience, and I'm not saying that these are separate, by the way, I'm just, they're just different ways of describing the experience, but there's a somatic experience, which is just the sense of this, this we'll, we'll call it an internal sense of being and feeling. And you could notice how there's a, for most of us, there's a, I think this, this kind of gripping or clenching or grasping sensation, trying to protect or get something or get to something or get rid of something but it's felt, it's not a abstract mental thing, it's actually felt. And to notice how much effort is required to maintain that. And what if right now, just for a moment, you just don't do that. So not trying to get rid of it, because that would just be using more effort, trying to get rid of effort. That's not what I'm talking about, I'm just talking about just dropping it for a moment or just yielding for a moment. You could imagine it's like, uh, well, so I, if, if you've never experimented with, uh, with this kind of thing before, then you won't know what the experience is like, but I would recommend it because it's an interesting experience. Uh, but if you have done this, then you'll know what I'm talking about. There's a, if you mix, starch and water so you could use any starch potato starch or corn starch are the most commonly available and you mix that with water uh, i i can't remember the ratio it's like two to one starch to water i think is kind of the ideal then it, it's very it's a very interesting substance because it's fluid but under uh, pressure, it becomes, it behaves more like a solid. So you can, you, if you dip your finger into it very slowly, your finger will go into it like a, like a liquid. If you take your finger out of it very slowly, it comes out just like a liquid. And you wouldn't know anything other than it's just, it seems like a liquid. But if you put your finger into it a little bit faster, then you'll be met with resistance. And actually, if uh, you may, if people do this experiment, you could fill a, a shallow pool with this stuff, and you can walk across it, walk walk across the surface like Jesus. <laughs> but if you stop, you'll sink in. And so we've all been, I think, we move so quickly. And with so much force, we use so much effort all the time that it's like that. We just stay on the surface and we, we're, there's just this constant tension and resistance. But if we just stop for a moment, not restraining, not trying to get something or figure something out or get rid of something, but just stop. Stop all the effort, stop all the force. 
then we sink in and there's a softening and we can recognize within ourselves this kind of fluidity So I'm suggesting you could notice that right now, that you could just notice that if you don't make the effort for a moment and you don't continue trying to figure it out and get somewhere and understand and protect, then you just sink into yourself. And oftentimes we're conditioned to interpret that as bad, scary, terrifying, falling, falling apart, the end, death. I don't know where I am. I don't know who I am. How am I going to figure out all my problems and fix them? But you could just do it anyway, just for a moment. It doesn't have to be something that you do forever. And then, from this, my experience is it's possible to just tell the truth, which is, despite all of my fears and ideas about this, it turns out that I'm still here. I thought that if I would just stop and sink, then it would all go very badly. Because it can sometimes seem like the, you know, the demons are on our tail and we can't stop. We have to keep running. If we stop for just an instant, they'll get us and they'll devour our souls. And that's why, by the way, I suggested at the beginning that everything that happens is healing. Everything is pointing us to this. It's pointing us to recognize the wholeness that's here because the demons on our tail that want to devour our souls and the extreme experiences that we can have are actually pointing us to discover this. And if that's true, which it's been true in my experience, because I've been there with the demons ready to devour my soul, and then I find myself at a dead end and there's nowhere left to go. So then, you know, and I... I Admittedly, I've spent a long time at that dead end with nowhere to go and still, like, metaphorically trying to claw my way up some sheer cliff. Horrible. But then to stop... For whatever reason, I mean, in my case, just sheer exhaustion, no, no energy left, no ability to try and run or escape. But I, I always would advise, just choose. Don't, don't wait until you're too exhausted. Don't wait until then. Don't put it off. Just choose now. Just stop. And... I have found that that's a gift. It's a gift that it was, it, it is the greatest gift that I have ever received. And it's the gift that I continue to receive every time that I stop. So then, that's step one stop. And if the if, if you are fearful that the demons are going to devour your soul, then 
so be it. Because maybe then you'll get to discover what remains. And so that's step one, this discovery of the, the lightness of being, the effortlessness of it, that there's no need to fix the problem or get somewhere or get rid of something. But as I said, what I've noticed is that oftentimes then that becomes a kind of denial of this experience in the, the manifest experience, let's say. So then people will say, oh, there is no person. And they do away with personal pronouns. And then there's just, they have to sit, speak in sort of convoluted ways. And it seems like a bit of effort is being made to try and defend something. So there is an authentic recognition, but then it gets twisted. And what I'm proposing is that there's a step two. And step two is to allow for that intimate recognition right now without defense, that recognition of wholeness and the lightness of being to then spill over into the manifest life, into the story of you, the story of me. Because if there's actually no one here, if there's actually nothing to defend, then who cares? Who needs to do away with personal pronouns? And what I have found in this is that, as I suggested at the beginning, then everything is a gift. Everything is healing. Everything is pointing to this and everything is the, the, the interface in which the purity of wholeness and healing is expressed in the diversity of the manifest life. So now that I've said so many words, I'm curious if anybody has anything, any words they'd like to say. Oh, and I should, I should mention, as I, I often forget, um, this is re being recorded. It will be on YouTube. So if you do choose to speak, then that will be in the recording and will be posted on YouTube. So you're giving your consent. Uh, yeah, that's it for now. No, I, I should say this because I because I also I I'm always hesitant to say it, but I do appreciate um, for anybody who finds value in this time together. I do always appreciate uh, your financial contributions, which you can do at uh, joeylot.com forward slash give. With that said, now. We will sit in silence until somebody unmutes themselves or until I speak again.
Okay, so I have an experiment we can do while we're sitting here. You're welcome to play along or not, but here's the experiment. As we're sitting here, choose this now. And notice how effortless that is. So put another way. Notice that the effort that you make is in rejecting this. Trying to make, trying to find something else, something better. And just as we're sitting here, or maybe for the rest of your life, see if it's possible. It is, so you don't need, you can just, maybe we can just say it is possible. Just see how effortless it is to just choose this, whatever is happening without having to make it better or different. I could say something. I feel my heart beating faster with the nervousness of saying something though. It's not good. Um, my head is doing my head in at the moment. So I notice how obsessed it is with making everything better around me. And I, I, I used to identify with that, that it's me that wants everything better. But I just started to think, is that really me or is it just my mind? You know, like a machine, like a robot, just looking for anomalies and mistakes and problems and assessing and, and then coming up with solutions like some crazy program <laughs> and I just realized today that like when is it ever going to end like when is it going to be like okay I'm perfectly satisfied with my environment or whatever um because I don't really get out into the world much so I don't it's not like relationship problems or anything yet my world's quite small but in the world that it is it's um many things bother me every day and it's like draining and uh you know it's like a little cut or something every day from the same thing and it's like you could you could use your energy to do something about that thing like you know um taking the tack out your foot like you said uh but if you don't have the energy to do anything about it then and it's well you just have to ac accept that i guess but it still drains me. So it's like, uh, I don't have any energy, but I continue to get drained by these things that my mind notices as problems and wants to solve, but can't. And it's just like, 
it's just stressful. I don't know. It's, uh, I can imagine, you know, like on a game where you see like the life bar and all that kind of thing, the energy going down. It's like, it's like all these things could be in a list and each one is just draining my energy every day, little by little, but it's only because I probably am not accepting it or something. I, I don't, I don't want that. Like I, I want to so, like have the energy to solve them and then they're not draining my energy, but that's kind of silly because it's just going to be more. <laughs> There's always going to be more. So yeah. Uh, it's kind of that's kind of like I don't know upsetting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> so you have a <laughs> habit of like the 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 programming is a wasteful expenditure of energy, and then the solution that you come up with is, well, I just need more energy. So you had more energy, then you'd just be using the same program. And uh, what I, what I really, uh, when, you were, when you were saying this, I, I like the imagery, like a robot or a machine. And uh, everything that you were describing was like a game. So then this, this uh, phrase seems appropriate, artificial intelligence. <laughs> so we think artificial intelligence, you know, the uh, whatever, whatever the names of these things, Alexa, it's artificial intelligence. But I, I'm, I'm the real intelligence. I'm, I'm authentic intelligence. Alexa is artificial intelligence. But what's the difference? So. It, that I'm proposing is not real intelligence. That's just, as you said, it's the programming. It's the conditioning. Mm. Now, if you let the, so if you let, if you had an Alexa and you let Alexa run your life, you, it's a crapshoot. Might go well, might not go well at all. And if you then just say, well, that's just how it is. Then you perceive yourself as a victim of this artificial intelligence. Mm. Because you mistake the artificial intelligence for yourself. Yeah. And what I'm saying is that when we continue to... So the, the artificial intelligence is the... It, it, it is the creator of the problem solution paradigm. It is binary. It's zeros and ones, on and off, yes and no, light and dark, good and bad. It's dividing everything, separates everything. That's what artificial intelligence does. Mm-hmm. What I'm proposing is that authentic intelligence which is what you are, recognizes wholeness. It recognizes healing. So how is it that we can introduce a new program into the artificial intelligence? One that is fundamentally based on wholeness rather than on division. It's not going to come through the artificial intelligence. It has to be introduced through authentic intelligence. Mm. And so when, so so from my perspective, it's really useful to recognize this, this, this programming is never going to be satisfied. And you can just follow it it's, you know, through your imagination, you can follow it to its logical conclusion and you can recognize never going to be satisfied, ever. Yeah. It cannot solve the problem because it is 
only creating problems. So then it seems like uh, at a certain level, if we're identified as the artificial intelligence, then it's like, uh, I, I love Star Trek, the, the original series. And uh, there were many episodes in which there was some kind of artificial intelligence that was running a planet or a species or uh, some rogue ship or something. And uh, the artificial intelligence at the end of the episode, Captain Kirk, usually is Kirk and Spock and the artificial intelligence and their you know, end game and everything, everything's going to be destroyed. And then they'll introduce some kind of, you know, some kind of puzzle to the artificial intelligence that the artificial intelligence can't deal with. And so it's like blows up. Sort of like a Zen cone, right? You introduce something. What is the sound of one hand clapping? And, the artificial intelligence is like, oh, I got to figure this out. I got to figure it out. I got to figure it out. I got to figure it out. And it just burns itself out. So it finally has to admit defeat. It can't, it can't figure that out. But we don't have to use that kind of violent approach. We don't have to burn it out. We can actually just, I'm, what I'm proposing is we can take a gentle approach. We can just, just pause, stop, just take a step back and recognize, hey, it's just, an, it's just a TV show. There's not really some artificial intelligence set to destroy everything. It's actually just Star Trek. So it's not actually a big deal. Now, you know, there could, there, we could find ourselves in our lives in these moments of crisis where there's somebody with a gun to our head but right now, that's not happening. So right now, we don't need to pretend like that's happening. And we don't need to guard against that because we can invent those. That's why I'm saying the demons are on our tail, but that's an invention. That's something that we use to continue this problem-solution paradigm, to continue to... So the artificial intelligence just keeps the, it, it keeps the, the, you know, wants more energy. You said it, it wants more energy. That's the solution. It's like, I'm almost, I almost got it. I almost got it figured out. I just need more energy, more energy, more energy. Where does it get the energy from? It gets the energy from the, the only power source there is. I mean, I've said this before. It's like all of this, all the energy on this planet comes from the sun. Whether you're burning a candle or you're, burning a diesel engine, or you're powering yourself with some food, it's all coming from the sun. And that's a metaphor. Everything, I, my experience is everything that is happening is it's symbolic. It's, a, it's showing us something, reflecting to us something of the nature, of, of our nature and of the nature of creation. So Star Trek is also showing, it's showing us that. You can see it anywhere. You don't have to go looking for it. It's here. It's present anywhere we look. We can find it in ourselves. We can find it in the room we're in. We can find it in the stars. We can find it in myth. We can find it in anything, anywhere, because it's all, it's like a, it is a hologram. So it's all every facet of it contains the whole which is reflecting to us our actual nature but we become entranced by the image and then we mistake that for we, we think that that's the totality of reality rather than reflecting something to us. It's the same with thought. We get entranced by thought, but by the content of thought, rather than recognizing that the thought is also reflecting to us. If we just tune into it in the right way, we can see 
that there's the direct experience of thought is just this unified happening. But we focus in on it and then we think, oh, that's, I got I to gotta do something with that. And that's just more of the artificial intelligence trying to figure out the solution to the supposed problem. So you can just step back. You can just notice, okay, yeah, it's trying to figure it all out. It's trying to solve the problem. But anytime that there's a problem, that's why also it's all healing because it's all showing you when you just recognize, when you can recognize it's, hey, there's a problem. Great. It's just showing you, it's just showing you that it's pointing you back to recognize this wholeness that's here that doesn't depend, doesn't have any problems whatsoever. Paul Hederman calls it um, rest, restlessness, discontent, and something else, some other word, I forgot what it was, and that's exactly how I feel, constantly. Yeah, who doesn't? Yeah. And I bet this program has got something to do with it. Just do Yeah, my but then don't, don't, don't mistake what I'm saying to say that you need to do something to fix the program. Because that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that that's just more of the program. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's problem, solution, problem, solution, problem, solution. So then when you, you catch a glimpse, and then right away, it, because of the habit of leaping right back into this narrow fixation, then we right away we say, oh yeah, now that's a problem that I'm gonna solve. Now I know the real solution. The real solution is that it's a program and I need to change that or get rid of it. But who's gonna do that? That's only an idea coming from the program. Because what I'm saying is that the actual, what we actually desire is not gonna come from that level. What we actually desire is immediately available. It's here right now. You don't have to go looking for it. You don't have to get something out of the way in order to have access to it. You don't need to fix anything. Just see how it is that there's effort required to energize that program. Mm. Just for a moment right now, I mean, really, just for, just for a split second. So don't try to sustain it, but just for a split second, like taking your hands off the wheel. Just don't do anything, just for one second. And then whatever happens next is fine, but in this one second, then you can tell the truth which is in this one second right now, is there a problem? No. Right. And then you can just start to check that out over and over and over and over, and you'll see. Anytime you check it out, there's no problem. But then the next second, the program is saying, but there is a problem. And you're in the habit of, believing that, which is fine. But you see, you, you can recognize right now that there is no problem. So then why be deceived by the idea that there's a problem that you need to solve? It's fine that that's happening. That's the conditioning. And you will be deceived by it. That's just wise to recognize that you will be deceived by it. But then you can, again, just stop for a second and recognize actually there's no problem. And the more frequently you glimpse that, then the less 
hold that program has, the less real it seems. Because what starts to happen is that this recognition of wholeness starts to spill over into the program. Mm. Because it's because there's benefit. See, you're stressed. Right? I mean, you're stressed. We're stressed and we don't like that. We think that we have to solve that by doing more of what we've always done. More energy. If I just had more energy, I'd figure it out. I'd fix it. But then we can glimpse that there's no problem. So then we can continue to glimpse that there's no problem. And what that does is it naturally, because we're not, it's not like the artificial intelligence is the enemy. It's not the enemy at all. That's how all of this is happening. It's the, the mechanics of creation. But if we're displeased with that, then we, we are fools to continue to invest energy into it. It's just, it just says more, 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 and we just keep giving it more. It's like, you know, the, 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 the person who just keeps coming to you and they're like, I just need, I, you know, they're, the, they're a gambler. They're a gam, gambling addict. And I say, I, I, I just one more time, one more time. This is, I'm going to win big this time. And you're the fool who keeps giving them money. Yeah. So it's challenging because we are so, because our, so this is my experience. That underneath this, so we can take a look and see, well, why do I keep doing it? Why on earth would I keep giving money to the gambling addict who's just destroying their life? And the same, why would I keep giving energy to this program that is doing nothing but generating misery? And my proposal, I mean, I, well, I just say take a look and you'll see for yourself. What I find is that it's because there's discomfort. Yeah. So the discomfort is like the gateway. And out of habit, when there's discomfort, I say, oh, more energy, more energy to the program. Quick, fix my problem. Alexa, get me a pizza. And then I eat the pizza and then I feel sick. Alexa, get me some Tums. <laughs> then I've got insomnia. Alexa, get me some drugs. So that's the habit, but it's the gateway because what it points us to or what it points me to is to recognize what's actually behind the discomfort. So the discomfort is actually a, an interpretation of the program. The program says, it's like, it's like a sign that says, don't, don't go beyond this point. The demons are that way. Don't go that way. And so just out of habit, I just go the other way. Feeding more energy to the program. It's like the Wizard of Oz, you know, at the end of the Wizard of Oz, and everybody knows this, it's famous, right? It's the, 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 the wizard is just this man behind the curtain. Just don't pay any attention to the man behind the curtain. I am the great and powerful Oz. <laughs> but it's, it's like, it was all just designed, it's all a trick. So it says, danger beyond this point, don't go this way. And so we just believe that and we don't go, but we can actually find out right now in our direct experience, what is here be beyond that point. Beyond that point is actually just here now. And you've already caught a glimpse of it, which is there's no problem. So it's like the demons are gonna eat your soul. Seems like a big problem. 
Oh my God, they're going to eat my soul. Then if you just don't make any effort and you don't try to fix the problem and you don't try to protect yourself and you don't try to run away and you just hear open, defenseless, Is there a problem? Can't find one when I close my eyes. Well, with your if eyes I'm, open, can you find one? I can, I can see both at the same time. It's like, on one level, like the mind sees a lot of problems around my environment, but on another level- Give me an example. Tell me the problems that it sees. Okay, small, but it annoys me every single day that my room that I spend every day in uh, is an absolute mess. Like there's just Great. papers so let's, everywhere. Right, so let's just look at that. Okay. So you're in the room, it's a mess. Yeah. Look at it. Yeah. So what is it that, what is the evidence that you have this is a problem? Stress, discomfort. Right. Draining. Right. So there's a feeling. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's a, there's a, there's a cycle in which you see the thing, you have the thought that says that's the cause of the problem. You're, that validates that this feeling is the feeling that means there's a problem, and round and round it goes. Hmm. But what's the actual proof that this is a problem? How do you know for sure that this feeling means that there's a problem? Just the feeling. You can see right. at the same time that you could ignore all that and be okay. Because mm -hmm. we're not talking about you know, house burning down type problem, just talking about petty little stressful things or whatever. So I can see that it's not a problem, you know, a threat to survival or anything like that. That would be- but That's at a thought level. I'm saying actually right now with your eyes open, seeing what you're seeing, feeling what you're feeling. So there is the feeling happening. There are the thoughts happening. There is the seeing that you're seeing happening. Mm -hmm. And isn't there also more, closer than any of that, before any of that, isn't there also a spaciousness that's just allowing all of this? I can see that, yeah. So then there's, an, there's a choice of where you give your energy. Your energy goes to this vicious cycle, which is, like I said from the beginning, it's what you don't want. You're unhappy with it. But it's what's familiar. It's what you know. You're skillful at it. You've been doing it every day. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes... See, then we think, oh, well, to do anything else is hard. Or beyond hard, sometimes we think anything else is impossible. I just don't know how. But it's like uh, anything, anything you've learned. You know, if you, you don't know, it, it, there was a time you didn't know how to read. Now you know how to read. Now, how did you go from not knowing how to read to knowing how to read? Because, there, you know, you didn't know how to read. Yeah. Those symbols didn't mean anything. So how do you go from not knowing how to read to knowing how to read? It's kind of a miracle. Mm -hmm. But we, we, once we've made that leap, we overlook the miracle. We just say, oh yeah, I, now I know how to read. It's easy. 
So it's the same here. You're in the habit of this is the only thing I know. All I know is when I'm in the room, it's a problem because it's a mess. And I know that that's true because I feel it. And I know that that feeling means what I think it means because that's what my mind says. And then I suggest, well, yeah, but that doesn't, that's not the only possibility. There's this infinite field of potentiality and you are in the habit of energizing this one particular pathway. And in order to, and, and you can even recognize as, I mean, cause you have, you recognize that, oh, well, that's not the whole and only truth. That's just one possibility. But what's also true presently is that there is this spaciousness, which is what I'm calling wholeness. And I'm saying that that is the infinite field of potentiality. So then how do you go from this habit of this is the only truth is that, ah, this sucks, it's a mess, I'm stuck, it will never get better, I don't know what to do, I gotta solve the problem, if I just had more energy, then I can solve the problem, but I don't have more energy and I'm being drained by the problem, so it's a vicious cycle. Two, a new possibility, and what I'm saying is, step one <laughs> is to recognize the spaciousness, the wholeness that's here in direct experience, that you don't have to go looking for, you don't have to create it, you don't have to work hard at it. In fact, you, it's, it's totally effortless. You have to actually make effort in order to energize the habit, even though it's a habit and it's compulsive. Yeah, you I was, have to give energy to that. I was thinking the other day when someone was talking that uh, what you said before about like you have to make effort to understand. I, I was just fascinated listening to them. Like, you know, it it seems like it doesn't take effort to understand what someone's saying, but really, I think it it does. It's just you're so good at it, you don't notice. But right. it's actually more. It seems more natural. To, to just be in the, yeah. the space, you know, right. and not have it make sense. And that seems similar to what you're saying about this, like, because mm -hmm. it's like in noticing there's a problem or interpreting the problem in the feeling and matching those together, that all takes clever work. And it's like a child wouldn't know how to do that. And, right. and he, you know, so it's the spaciousness is there naturally mm -hmm. and you don't have to do anything. And actually what I am doing is, is like on top of that. It's yeah, that's right. And the system is set up to so so that in my experience that's absolutely true. And the system seems to be set up to encourage repetition of what's already known. And it you can see how as I've just pointed out, and, and you can. You can just test it out for yourself to see if it's true in your experience. Is that 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 becomes its own? It's like its own function. It just does. It, it's automatic, and it maintains itself by this: don't turn back, don't look here, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, mm -hmm. because. It actually does require effort, as you're saying, to maintain this. So by it, it would not maintain itself if it didn't have this mechanism built in that said, don't turn back, don't recognize the source. Because if you did, then the whole thing falls apart. Because then it's like, well, this is stupid. I don't want that. I'm not going to energize that anymore. Mm -hmm. So that's why in my experience that's why the mechanism continues the function continues is because of that little thing the sign that says beware don't go past this point there's danger beyond and that's why i think for most of us we're not willing to actually investigate that until the suffering is severe enough but it doesn't have to be that the suffering is so severe before we're willing to investigate. We can investigate any time because the spaciousness is here. 
So then it just becomes, from my perspective, uh, about, well, that's why I've been talking about this authentic desire, is just to start to tune into. So step one, as I said, is just to notice the wholeness, the spaciousness that's here, the unified experience, undifferentiated experience that doesn't, it's not dependent upon any of the ideas or thoughts or functions or problems or solutions or any of that. It's here primary. Mm -hmm. It's here when, I mean, it always, it's here when you're asleep, it's here when you're awake. You're waking in, you, you, you wake up into the spaciousness, you sleep in the spaciousness. Your existence as you know yourself to be is occurring in this spaciousness. And you can see that everything that you ever thought ha has ever happened, your whole life story, is happening here in the spaciousness now. There's that you can't find anything else. It's all only the spaciousness. So that's step one, which people complicate because they turn it into some other thing, like some other experience, but it's not. It's just very ordinary. It's always the case. Everybody can recognize it. Yeah. That's, but then people think, oh, but that's, that's supposed to be, I thought that was supposed to be some amazing thing. And so then they're off looking for something else because they say, well, that's not it because it's not so, such an amazing thing. I thought I was supposed to be looking for this like psychedelic thing. Mm -hmm. But that's why people miss it is because it's so ordinary. So step one, very simple, just recognize the spaciousness, the wholeness is here. Step two is to then allow for that authentic desire that arises from that to spill over, which is the creative process, because that's how, how, do, you, how do you go from not reading to reading, not riding a bike to riding a bike, not walking to walking. You could say, well, there were all these steps. You had to do this. You had to do that. You had to, you know, learn your ABCs. You had to learn how to read simple things. You had to learn how to balance on the bike. You had to, I mean, all that you could say all that, but actually, no, there's some magic thing that happens between not and yes, no and yes. It, there's a magic thing. It appears to be steps, but actually it's magic. It happens like that. And how do we facilitate that? And what I'm proposing is that we continue to tune into this wholeness and then we allow ourselves to uh, be moved by this authentic desire. So you have, so you're in the room and there's this habit of the program of, oh, it's a mess, this is horrible, and then the dream. If only I had enough energy, I could fix this problem, but oh, I don't have the energy to do it, so it's just now it's worse. So then that's pointing you to, hey, just stop. Tune into the spaciousness. And so the mind has all of these ideas. The conditioned mind has all these ideas about what the problem is and what the solution is going to be. Well, I need to clean it up. That's going to be the solution. You know, it might be part of it, maybe. I don't know, but clearly not in the way that you've been going about it. So you can then just start to notice that that's what the mind thinks it wants. That's what it thinks its desire is, is to get rid of this mess. But the authentic desire, is, I, I can assure you, has nothing whatsoever to do with that because it just doesn't, doesn't even know anything about messes and doesn't care. I mean, it's actually... It's just a, a, a mental construct that there's a such a thing as a mess and the mess means something. Yeah, a kid wouldn't know with a really. A baby certainly wouldn't know. It's it's learned. Yeah. It's a conceptual framework thing. So the authentic desire has nothing whatsoever to do with mess. What's the authentic desire then? Well, uh, the authentic desire doesn't have it, it's not a word. No. So, you know, the the we could use words to describe the authentic desire. 
which is the best we can do if we're talking about it. But you can just notice if you just, so for a moment, actually, you could try it just with your eyes closed, because so, that might be easier. Yeah. And you could just notice this spaciousness that's here. I think that's the authentic desire is to be tuned into the spaciousness, really. Right. The, the, it's like a peaceful. Yeah. You know, like nothing, there, nothing's a problem. That's the authentic yeah. desire is to feel that right. nothing's a problem. Right. Yeah. But I would, I would slightly modify that and say, because that's sort of true, but also a slight distortion because then it, the, the authentic desire, you can see the authentic desire is when you talk about it, it's then you say, is to feel a certain way. But that's not true either. The authentic desire is actually already present in the spaciousness. So rather than it having to be that the authentic desire is to feel a particular way, which would not necessarily be the case already. Yeah, you're saying, saying it's already there. The authentic desire is what's already present. So, so are you saying already, they're all, like all authentic desires are all already present because that's crazy. <laughs> Well, yes, because how else is it going to, how else could it be? If it's not already present, how else could it be? You see, th this game that we play, well, then it's going to be something in the future. And then we're back into the problem solution thing. What? That is mind blowing. <laughs> but that's how it works. So every time a person wants something, it's already here. Isn't that the case? I mean, the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> okay, what happens in the Wizard of Oz? Remember, you remember? Have you have, have you read the book or seen the movie? Yeah. yeah. So at at the end of the Wizard of Oz, you know, it's like she goes on this long journey and she's got to do all these things. She's got to go to the witch's castle. She's got to deal, you know, defeat the witch, and then uh, and get the rubies. So have the well, I got it. God knows what she's got to do. She's got to do all these things, and then she goes to the Wizard of Oz, and then the Wizard of Oz. Uh, is going to eventually, after she, he's revealed to be this man behind the curtain, and then he's like, well, actually, you know what, I came from Kansas too, and I'm going to go back to Kansas, I've got this balloon, and you can come with me, and they have this big celebration, yay, and then he goes off without her, and so then the, at the end, uh, Glenda says, well, you just, you know, it was, it was, in, it was in you all the time. She says, and here's how you, here's all you have to do is just close your eyes and tap the slippers and say, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. And then she wakes up in Kansas and there's all the, you know, there's the, the farm hands. And she's like, you, and you were there and you were there and you were there. So where, where, where did all this take place? When did it take place? So it's, that's, this is all, that's why I'm saying it's all healing because everything that's happening is revealing to us, it's pointing us to discover this wholeness that's already present. And what I'm saying is that it's, if we keep it to this, this idea of wholeness that's only found by tuning out of this, then that's not real wholeness because we have this experience of the manifest. So wholeness includes the manifest. Can't exclude it. That wouldn't be wholeness. So it has, it, so it's brought into the manifest. That's what the stories tell us. That's what our experience is. So the, in the Wizard of Oz, she's changed. Right? She didn't just go on the journey and, and then come back and everything's the same. She's changed. So, wh but where did that come from? It didn't come from, like, there wasn't, that journey didn't happen in the manifest. It didn't happen in time. She didn't do things to solve problems and then things changed. It happened within. It happened in, in what I'm describing is this mythical realm, which is the which is the 
deep dive into wholeness. And from that is where the transformation arises. But it's already present. It's not, not happening in time. And that's why that whole problem solution paradigm is just nonsense. Because you can't get there from here. You can't do that. You can't. We've all tried. We've all beat our heads against the wall trying to fix all of our problems over and over and over and over and over and over. I still do. We all do. Until we realize, wait a second, that's not working. Like, you know, Dor like Dorothy. Dorothy was trying to solve all her problems. She's lonely. She's unhappy. She's got this Miss Gold. She's so mean. She's take, you know, going to take your dog. She, she's going to run away, but then the tornado. So her hand is forced. Just like what I was talking about, where I, I'm like, years ago, I'm trying to solve my problems, trying to solve my problems over and over and over. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And then I find myself at a dead end. It is okay, though, isn't it, to tidy a room, say. It's just... It's just that you don't want the program to be in control of you or your life, right? You, you want to... Well, you want to recognize that the program is not in control of you. That's the thing. You thought that the program was in control of you, so you thought you were a victim. And what, what, what we recognize in, from my perspective, true transformation comes from the recognition that, it, I mean, it's a, to, tra to change form. To change form and what is changing form? What is that that's changing form? Because it's not the form, right? That's the thing is we think we're the form. And then if we're going to transform, what is it that's transforming? The form can't transform. The form is gone. The form that the, the form is always revealed to be gone. So what is it that's transforming? I don't know. Yeah, right. That's right, because the program doesn't know. The form can't know what it is that it is made out of. But you can. And it doesn't have words. So... Because the words are the words are products of the program. Mm. Words are divisive. Words are separating. They're saying this and that, here and there, you and me, black and white, up and down. Problem, no problem. Yeah, problem, no problem. Problem solution. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So the so that's all the level of words. But Well, but you're not defined by words. You're not defined by form. You're not defined by problems and solutions because those things all come and go. I thought I was. Right. We all were trained to think that we were. Mm. Because that was how, well, it's just, just how it works. Probably evolved that way for a reason, I guess. But it becomes, it's just not efficient anymore. You know, it's right. just, now it's, it's becoming whatever the word is, you know, it's unhelpful. Burdensome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's like disidentifying with the program is now, that's going to be more helpful than identifying with it, I think. Yes. And just a, a, a subtle clarification is you don't have to disidentify because that would then then that sets it up as a, yet another thing that you have to do and what i'm saying yeah. is you already are not identified as that that's actually just happening in the program but you so th so the program does not have access to spaciousness the yeah, program like does plain right, isn't it different level yeah. Yeah. But you do. So then 
it's just a matter of telling the truth, which happens now. It's not something you have to progress toward or understand in time. It's instantaneous right now, anytime you just recognize right now that there is wholeness, spaciousness, aliveness, unboundedness that's here now. And who could recognize that other than that? That's, that's it. Do you get lost in believing the program again sometimes or? You must do occasionally. Well, it's a tricky question because uh, depends how you want me to answer it. Um, do, does the, the, does, I mean, the real truth is no. The real truth is nobody could ever possibly get lost in that because th that's not possible. But uh, entranced by short. And then you, and then you might realize sometimes, oh, I was entranced by that, and and see the space. Well, sort of, yeah. But the, but the, but again, the. So, the the. You know, people talk about waking up, and it's not a bad term to use because, it sort of is like waking up. You can't be awake and asleep at the same time. When you're awake. So when you're asleep, then if you're then it could seem if you're entranced by the dream, it could seem like oh this is the problem. You could have demons chasing you that want to devour your soul. But in the instant of waking up, where where does the dream go? And the, at that point, who cares about the dream? There's no need to solve any problem because it's gone. And so in the same way, it, the waking up is always instantaneous. It's a shift. It's just a shift that happens now. You can just instantaneously recognize right now in your direct experience. And we don't, whatever, just direct experience. We don't even have to call it anything else. Just right now, without giving your attention to the dream or the conceptual filter or anything that you want to call that. It's just obvious that this is happening. Mm -hmm. And then who cares what problems seem to be? So you can, you can switch, you can, tr actually switching is pretty nice because then you, it, 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 I think it's a helpful practice, if we want to say. You can just notice, okay, room, problem, mess, problem, oh, I got to do it, draining my energy, and then spaciousness. And then, oh, back into the oh, room. Oh, no, it's a big problem. Oh, spaciousness. <laughs> and so then it starts to get clear that, wait a second, the dream is always happening in awakeness. Actually, when I thought I was in a dream, I was awake. Because who was aware of the dream? So all that can happen is when, the, when there, there can seem to be this phenomenon of, of being entranced by the dream, but the more you, the more you choose to wake up, the clearer it becomes that it's, it's just, who cares if, if a dream is happening? Who cares if there's trance happening? Because it's always happening in awakeness. There's always awakeness because you are awake. Mm. You're awake to the dream. You're awake to that. I mean, that's why they say, um, in, in, uh, you know, some, some philosophies, they'll talk about, you know, they'll say there, there's, there's four states in, in the, whatever system they talk about this, there's deep sleep, dream, waking, and then the fourth state is the state that contains the other three. So what we think of is waking where you say, oh, I woke up from the dream, it's not, it's, it, it's still separate from the dream, right? Because you say, well, I'm awake or I'm dreaming. You're not doing both at the same time. But the fourth state, which is what all this is pointing to, is that you are always awake. You're awake to the waking state. You're awake to the dreaming state. You're awake to this, the deep sleep state.
I mean, it's not complicated. So it's not like a thing that you have to understand in the future. It's just obvious. How do you know that you were asleep? How do you know that you're awake? Because you were awake to all of it. You were aware of all of it. You're not aware in deep sleep, though. Yeah. You are. Not consciously. There's, there's just no, ob no, it's not unconscious. There's just no objects. Or there's su a very subtle object. You don't remember it, though. Well, you do. You do because you remember that you were asleep. Only upon waking. Yeah. But you, but that's what I'm saying is that the, the these three, these three uh, ordinary, uh, I don't know, the three states that we normally identify with um, are, we could say, gross states. The fourth state is subtle. Is there's no objects that we, but the this deep sleep state is a subtler state because there's very subtle objects. But you still know when you wake that you were asleep. You don't have to analyze it or figure it out. You can just, it's just, it's not a complicated thing. It's just obvious. You are always aware of these states. Not, no, I'm not proposing that you are having thoughts while in deep sleep about how you are in deep sleep. That's not at all what I'm proposing because those, those are, um, those thought objects are too gross for that. For, I mean, the fourth state is so subtle. There, it, it has, it knows nothing of objects. And I'm just talking about what we're talking about now, just that you are aware of this spaciousness. Yeah. Like I'm awake to the spaciousness, but. Mm -hmm. And that spaciousness is present in deep sleep. The state, yeah. all these states come and go in, in spaciousness. Yeah, makes sense. Because spaciousness is just, seems to be what's alive or conscious or it's just this, whatever this is. Well, it's also just obvious. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you don't even, again, you don't have to try to figure it out because it wouldn't do you a whole lot of good. I mean, you, there are plenty of people who can write a lot of things about these things and it doesn't do them a lick of good because they're not, they're not recognizing it. They're just, they have a scholarly understanding of it, maybe because they've caught glimpses of it, but they're not, they're not cultivating that. And so then just, to, it's, I, I feel like it, in the waking state, for the person in the waking state, uh, this can have value. And that's all that really, I think that's all we're concerned with because we don't really care about what do, you, do you care about the deep sleep state? Because there's no problem in deep sleep. No, it's really not. And do you? And you don't care about. I mean, spaciousness doesn't have a problem. A messy room so is not a problem when I'm in deep sleep. <laughs> right. There's no messy room problem in deep sleep, and there's no messy room problem in spaciousness. The messy room problem only is appearing in the waking state for this apparent person. And so, in order for the, I'm interested in the the uh, wholeness spilling over into the waking state. That's, that, that's, I mean, I, otherwise I don't know what the point of the conversation is because other, I mean, people get into all these weird philosophical arguments about what's the most pure spirituality or whatever. And I don't, for who, who cares? Mm -hmm. it, it only really matters for the person in the waking state doesn't matter for anything else. I see what you're talking about. I do. So I guess it's just a switch often. And like you say, hopefully spill, spill over or something. 
Yeah, well, I, not hopefully it does. That's what I'm saying is that the more frequently you switch or shift to this direct recognition of wholeness or spaciousness or stillness or aliveness or vastness or whatever you want to call it, non-objective, non-conceptual reality, then inevitably that spills over because what happens is the purity of your desire becomes manifest because your, your attention is going to that rather than energizing the patterns that you're dissatisfied with. So it'll have less of a grip because you're going to be using it less or something, the conditioning. Yeah, well, it's like, it, the, you know, the expression, if all, if all you have is a hammer, then the whole world looks like nails. Mm -hmm. So, you know, then where, where do the other, where, where are the other tools? That's what I'm saying is that you can find, you can discover these and, and they come into creation from the source. That's where everything comes from. We can just observe that in our direct experience. That's where everything is coming from. That's where everything is coming from right now. That's where this, this right now is coming from. It's where the thoughts are coming from. It's where the light is coming from. It's where everything is coming from. It's coming in and out from the unmanifest. I knew that, you know, accepting all of this, these things that are bugging me constantly, you know, just accepting them would help, but I couldn't just force myself to accept them. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I get what you're saying. So I will, I'll try that. Um, I'll do that. Well, I'm doing it right now, but I'll continue. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good. I hope that was interesting to people. <laughs> Nobody else spoke up. <laughs> and unless somebody else does want to speak up it's like oh all right awesome always <laughs> um can you hear me i can hear you yeah um last week i tell uh, like a probably like three days ago, um, there were these uh, triggers. Uh, I mean, I've always had these uh, while I was here, or I, I think I, all this, I ha had the thoughts of um, like not being able to connect and isolation all throughout the childhood and I was like and even here in Canada I was like okay I could um I could let go of it and see the see what I was running away from all, all of my life that is that unworthiness sense of oh I'm this there's something happening underneath all of those what I perceive is oh, I'm unlovable or I, I could see that and, and and I let go of it but something happened like a couple of days ago. Like I, I wanted to be sad about it. I was like, I, I went into this. I listened to whatever. Like I'm, I'm, I'm gonna forget. I'm gonna let. I'm gonna forget letting go. Now I'm just gonna get get into this rabbit hole and just go into my childhood traumas and how I was. And I felt like there was nothing there. Like all throughout, all throughout my life, I didn't feel any connection. Like I was, I was like even now. I didn't feel like I, I just see, I just see the same patterns over and over again. Like it's, it's never ending. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I went into this deep depressive mode and I was like crying all night. And I, I've, I, I couldn't even recover for the, for two days. I was just in that state. Cause I, 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 I was like, enough letting go. I just want to be sad now. And mm -hmm. I did. Um, but and in that state it felt it felt really hopeless. I felt like 
this is what I, this is what my life is going to be i guess cuz i've seen it happening over and over again and i bet it's going to happen probably <laughs> for the rest of my life and um i don't know it, it was just so depressing it was just um and we hear stories about people ha- like happily married ma- being married for like 50 years and suddenly everything falls apart and they bec- they become this um lonely animal again and uh, they they lose their homes they they lost their wife and they're in this um what do they call where all the retirement retirees live i don't know retirement home or something with other others and it feels like there's no there's no real solution to this for for me especially like no no matter what i always get back to that what what bugged me when i was 5 mm-hmm. <laughs> it doesn't like it's uh, now i realize it, it uh, uh, people say oh you're just a child you'll grow up and you'll you'll see the you'll see that it was just something stupid that you thought about it it wasn't like it was it's the same thing that i'm dealing even now and mm-hmm. i see it happening even in like 80 year olds mm-hmm. and and i was like okay i feel like there's actually no solution the way i thought not life needs to be that that, that isn't working i feel like maybe just what i've recognized through my through, through how i recovered from obsessive thinking is there's just this unworthiness beneath everything just playing playing out like i could get back to that letting go now it's like okay i could sit here and not not thinking about how how whom should i talk to like maybe i can talk to some people maybe i'll feel better or like i i i let go of all of those ideas and i stay, just stayed with what was driving everything mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it was just this this uh, emptiness and loneliness or whatever beneath all of that there's just something that i didn't want um mm-hmm. when when you talked about that spaciousness it, it was allowing everything like so when the spacious is allowing why why the hell do i care to to escape from this Mm-hmm. like something in me that's accepting and loving all of this so why, why do i need to look for something outward like what my mind says i need to have to fill this up and it seems like that's that's pretty nice that's pretty good but i do feel like i need what my mind says to like maybe i need i need to connect with people maybe that needs to happen too like it's it's still there's still that drive you know it's like that needs to be done too it's not that this isn't this is fine mm-hmm. but do you think me and this is just this is just such a tricky thing like that like you say do i have to do that do i have to do this or like do i have to be okay can i just stay okay with this for the rest of my life i know i'm not going to get anything i'm not going to get any cake or any slice of pizza for the rest of my life it's i'm i'm okay with this for now but i feel like i i need i need that i mean having a partner would be nice having a friend circle friend circle that i truly value would be nice like doing stuff that i'm passionate about would be nice but mm-hmm. what do you say to that uh, the the um So you can so you live surrounded by people. Mhm. And for the most part humans are social. Mhm. So you actually have to make effort not to have friends. Mhm. Uh-huh. And so I think that what you described is very clear. but then just see how it is that you indulge that these these uh you know the sense of unworthiness and the sense of hopelessness that there's 
that this is just the way it is, that you've never known anything else, and so there's nothing else to know, mm -hmm. as a way to energize the patterns and habits of avoiding those relationships. Mm -hmm. And then the flip side of that is then, oh, now I need to do something to socialize. Mm -hmm. I need to do something to meet people. I need to do something in order to fix this problem. Mm -hmm. But what I'm proposing is if you just check it out, you'll see that it's not so much what you need to do, it's what you're already doing. Mm -hmm. It's what you're doing to avoid. And that can look like it can be overt or it can be subtle, but if you're observant, you'll start to notice it and you'll notice that it stems from this unworthiness that you indulge. Indulge in uh, the unworthiness and mm -hmm. block myself off? Yeah. Hmm. So then, you know, what if, so you can just, you can just start to notice when you are going about your day, how this sense of unworthiness or that this is just how things are and this and that's how it will always be, that that informs your actions, even in a subtle way, the way that you interact with other people, the way you either move mm -hmm. toward or away from, mm -hmm. and the ways that you then have, feel that you have to project an image in order to be acceptable and how much effort that requires hmm. rather than just being yourself. Hmm. And that's why I've, I've often said to you, there's so many people, you don't need to be friends with all of them. You don't need all of them to love you and approve of you. You just need a few who really see you and who appreciate you and value you. Mm -hmm. And that's not hard. They're there. But then, but you can see how much effort you make to keep that away. Mm -hmm. I can definitely see that playing out, like that unworthiness. Ah, oh, it's going to be like this. Um, there's this. Um, uh, I wish I didn't read these blogs, but <laughs> I could relate to it so much. Um, of international students coming to Canada and feel like they're being shut off from 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 here. It's like that's how I felt. Like I was always felt like we don't need you here, kind of thing. I felt like an interloper. Um, <laughs> and maybe what he said comes stems from all of that, you know? Maybe it's not that people are people. And yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's so, so you can find evidence for, for these things. But again, it, it, where, where you're living, there's, I don't, I don't know how many people, many people, you're living in a city. There's many yep. people. So yep. even if 99% of the people who live there uh, automatically reject anybody who's not Canadian born, so what? 1%. <laughs> yeah. And if you are just yourself and willing just to be yourself and to be, rather than indulging or suppressing that unworthiness, just, just to just allow, just allow, okay, yeah, there's, there is this sense of unworthiness. There is this sense of, 
hopelessness. There is this energy of despair or whatever. Hmm. But if you just allow that and don't, don't, don't move away or toward, you can notice that that's, that is your authenticity and it's actually very attractive. So then you attract those people without you having to go making all of the effort and trying so hard. Hmm. Because you know, you, you, I mean, it, when you meet people, when you interact with people, it's natural. You, you just interact with them. They say something to you, you say something to them. You're attracted to somebody, you walk up to them, you say something, you say, hi, it's not hard. We have ways of greeting, you know, hi. So then you can just see what it is that is preventing that. And it's just you making effort to stop that because otherwise it's the flow happens. It's, it's natural. Hmm. People interact. So all exactly. that could be happening is there's discomfort and you then use that discomfort as, as an excuse to, to make effort to try and hide or protect or seek, all of which ends up not getting you what you're really wanting. Hmm. Because what you really want is people who see you and appreciate you for who you are, not for how you pretend to be or project yourself to be. This, this really does make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I see that, I saw that happening too. And um, I asked my uh, crush out for a date and it, it worked out <laughs> and um, I saw the unworthiness playing in, in that, like, uh, in that too. It's like, oh, maybe I have to do, do something. I have to try to be something to be acceptable. I have to put out. But it was, it was draining. It's like, they got me telling that, they got back to me telling that, oh, this is overwhelming. We get, maybe we can slow it down. But what was just happening was just me, me thinking, maybe I have to be something or do something to be okay. But maybe it's not needed it's just me being myself is enough mm -hmm. it's true and i never thought uh i'd get a date but it happened <laughs> felt like wow me being myself was oh, i thought it was unacceptable but it wasn't true that's not what i've heard from them it's like right it's, saw me as I am and maybe I should, I can be as I am and stay like that. Even though I feel un like that unworthiness mm -hmm. always telling me, pointing me, Oh, you got to run away. You got to do something. You got to hide or do portray this image or you'll be, you'll lose whatever you have. Or maybe I can let on, let down all of that. And just, as you said, uh, uh, keep the flow going as it is rather than trying to get somewhere. Yeah, because, yeah. you know, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I think I know what you meant, but yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. What do you mean by that? By what? Wherever you go, you're... Oh, well, just, just what it says. Wherever you go, there you are. Okay. <laughs> well, it's just, you know, we think, we think if we go somewhere, then that's going to be better. Mm -hmm. And we get there, and there we are. Okay. So you, you can't, you, you're not going to outrun yourself. You, you bring yourself wherever you are. All you can do is, you know, you've got options. You can try and hide yourself or you can just be yourself. Hmm. 
And that's all I'm saying is 99% of people might reject you. Yeah. And 99% of people might reject me. Hello? You know, they might say, Hello? that person's weird. I don't like that person. So what? Mm -hmm. If you, if you uh, attempt to be somebody else in order to gain friendship, then you have to live with the anxiety all the time of they don't really like me. They only like what I pretended to be. Hmm. Meanwhile, the 1% of people who are looking for you who are saying, oh, I wish I could find that person who's, I don't know where they are. They can't find you because you're pretending to be somebody else. Hmm. So it seems to be a pretty common thing for people that they experience anxiety of in, in social situations, in interacting with others. I think it's pretty fairly universal. And I don't think that the solutions that commonly are proposed of how you can attract people by being uh, pretending to be something different are very successful. I think they just exacerbate the anxiety and just feed into that sense of unworthiness because if you can only, if you attract people or you can manage to have friends only when you are pretending to be someone else, then it just feeds into this sense of, oh yeah, it confirms that, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm no good. Nobody could actually like me. The only way that anybody could like me is if I pretend to be somebody else. Hmm. And so then you can, you could live your life, your whole life with, and feel isolated and feel alone and feel that nobody loves you and that you're unlovable and that there's no possibility of anything else. But it's a choice. And it, it's a choice that comes out of uh, avoiding or attempting to avoid your fear. But I think you know, and I mean, it's at least logically more sensible to just be yourself. And then how many people do you need in your life who, for, for your social fulfillment? Not many. Not many, yeah. I mean a handful in your set. So you think there's a handful of people who could love and appreciate you for who you are? I think so. Mm -hmm. I think that's true of everybody. Mm -hmm. And so then it seems to me like we could just be ourselves. Yeah. Be, be better that way. I, lo I love the Oscar Wilde quote, be yourself, everyone else is already taken. Hmm. Yep. I've heard, yeah. Yeah. For sure. Oh, I'm, I'm just gonna ask this one last question. I know it's a bit late, but it, this has been bothering me. It's the sense that now that I have someone to say that they're into me and like, uh, but I don't, we don't seem to have a lot of communication going on. It seemed to be one-sided for me and this and I can't keep, I keep getting to this doubts like oh um it, like it's is, is it really gonna happen is it just like another day or I don't know they seem to sh show me interest in but again this comes like tied up to unworthiness do I have do I keep doing this or uh, I don't know where this is going but mm -hmm. They seem to be okay with me as I am. Like, uh, it's just that no text back. When I text, I don't get a text back or like, 
uh, it rarely does this, there rarely is a, a communication going on, but yeah, I don't know what to ask you for this, but I feel like, I don't know. Um, Yeah, there's just this, again, an insecurity going on about mm -hmm. what needs to be done, how to act properly, and whether this will work out, or mm -hmm. what's going on, or, or, and yeah. do you think that's just do the same thing as just being myself, show, show up being myself, and not try to push a conversation, not try to make this happen? Send so you're, allowed, you're allowed to have your wants and preferences, and... And uh, so there's, you know, two sides of this. One is you can recognize that you don't need other people to do anything particular in order for you to know your own self-love and fulfillment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's perfectly okay for you to have your preferences. Mm -hmm. And so if you feel like uh, you, know, you don't have to you don't you don't have to uh, continue to uh, accept things that are not fulfilling for you mm -hmm. there's so many possibilities you know but again being yourself, being authentic, being honest. And there are lots of uh, ways in which to, you know, processes for communication that can help, be helpful for expressing mm -hmm. how you're feeling and what you're wanting in ways that are uh, non-confrontational and mm -hmm. that um, allow you and whoever else you're communicating with to hear what is really wanted and needed and the, the, the you know, the, just the genuine heartfelt desires without it turning into, uh, you know, you're, you're doing the wrong thing or you're letting me down or I'm upset with you. It could, mm -hmm. Just lots of ways to do that. But also, if you're pinning all of your hopes on one thing, mm -hmm. you know, that's you can just also recognize that too, because then it, that can also be an indulgence of the unworthiness. Is oh, you know, nobody else. I'm 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 actually unworthy, and nobody else will ever love me but this one person. <laughs> and so then everything depends on this one person, and then mm -hmm. this one person has to do what you think they have to do in order for you to feel the way that you want to feel, so that you can no longer have to suffer, but you can see that that's a trap too. Yeah. Because again, I mean, even if we say 99.999%, if 99.999% of people reject you, still in the city where you're living, that leaves quite a few people. Yeah, they have 200,000 people here. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. so that's quite a few people. So then you don't need to pin everything on one person. It's a lot of pressure for one person. Yeah. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. That's why, um, you know, that's why, why uh, Dorothy didn't go it alone. It wasn't just her and Toto. It was the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Lion, plus the Glenda and the Wizard. So it's a it's an adventure. I don't know the story, but I'll look it up. <laughs> look it up.
Yeah. That's all the questions I have. Good. All Thanks. right. Thank you. All right. Well, I'm going to have lunch. Thank you, everybody. See you next week. Bye for now.